chemical bonding. And they do it, this in terms of climate change. And I'd love to spend time on climate change. This is, uh, you know, I'm an environmental chemist. So um, there just isn't much time <laughs> for that type of stuff as much as it would be nice. But so here's our learning go goals. Become familiar with types of bonds and lattice energy. Start to do that already. Relate electronegativity and bond polarity. Name compounds and write formulas for names. So you're going to be able to get a formula, write the name, or be given the name and write the formula. Both of those are fair game. Effectively draw Lewis structures for a variety of compounds. Recognize exceptions to the octet rule. In this case, exceptions are important. Okay, lots of times I, I, I say, okay, we're not going to worry about the exceptions. You know, we did a, a, a couple of the uh, electron configurations that were exceptions, you know. Here, same thing. There's going to be a couple of exceptions you're expected to know. Um, and then we're going to utilize formal charge as a way to determine the correct Lewis structure. We're going to get to a point where we can draw two Lewis structures for the same compound, and they're both going to be valid based on the Lewis rules. And with the formal charge, that's why we teach this, might be like, well, why are we bothering with this? Well, it's for the purpose of figuring out the correct Lewis structure. Okay. All right. So these are types of chemical bonds. Once again, there's the ionic where you build these crystals, right? And there's no such thing as a molecule. You have this crystal. And then you've got the covalent ones where the electrons are shared rather than transferred. And then you've got the metals. And metals are you know, great materials. They're really cool materials. Metals and superconductors and things like that. There's a lot of great chemistry in there. And we utilize these types of materials. You know, we're talking, I'm talking about photovoltaic cells in my environmental chem class right after this today. I'm gonna to talk about semiconductors and how light can, can hit that metal and excite an electron and we can use that as a way of source of energy, right? That's the whole idea behind photocells. So electrons are very delocalized. That is, they're not held by individual atoms. People describe it as like a sea of electrons. They're kind of only loosely held. So effectively, that's what makes them great conductors. The electrons can flow along that wire. They're not held by the individual atoms strongly. And you get that great con conductivity. That's obviously why we have copper wires in our house for that conductivity purposes. So ionic bonds, electrostatic attraction, you get your, po your positive and negative, your cation and anion. Um, covalent is shared. Um, the shorter, the, the stronger the bond, typically the shorter it is. Double bond, triple bonds are the strongest. Double bonds are less strong. Single bonds are less strong. That make, should make sense to you. Just like three pieces of rope are gonna be better than one piece of rope, right? No different there. Uh, we can measure bond angles. I mean, uh, distances a little bit differently depending on the compound. Um, and we can me measure energies of bonds by basically you know, breaking those bonds and figuring out how much energy it takes to do that. So here's that equation with the constant in it. Oppositely charged particles are held together by this attraction, this electrostatic potential energy. It's similar to like Coulomb's law, if you will. And these are actual charges. I think I said this on my video, Coulombic charges, these Q1 and Q2. But we can use like, um, their periodic charge, if you will, their electronic charge as just a, a way to get a feel for the relationship between how the charge and this attraction is affected. So the larger these numbers are, right? It's in the numerator, the greater the energy of attraction, this lattice energy, okay? So that means if I had, you know, sodium chloride versus calcium oxide, well, the two plus and the two minus are larger numbers, right? So that gives you a greater attraction, okay? And the other thing you have to think about is this distance of separation. That's what this is. The separation distance. We can estimate that by the atomic size because imagine two really big atoms, 
right? The distance is basically from here, is one way to measure it from nuclei to nuclei. So the bigger they are, the further they're apart, as opposed to two small atoms like this, right? So that can be estimated from this right, for this right here. So you don't need to do any calculations to understand that, that um, lithium fluoride will have a greater lattice energy than lithium chloride. Why? What's that? Because chloride's bigger, right? The further apart, that D is going to be larger because chlorine's a bigger ion. You know, the periodic trend, if you go down, it gets larger. So lithium fluoride will have, they're closer together, stronger energy holding that crystal together than lithium chloride would. Does that make sense? And then the charges you can throw in there also. Like I said here, calcium oxide, you know, that plus two plus minus. The charge has a little bit bigger effect. I mean, when you look at the changes in charge, you get quite a big lattice energy change. You can see that here. So there's plus two minus two magnesium oxide, and it's 3791. So this is measured as the energy release. That's why it's a negative sign. We'll learn that when we get more of the energy section, which is chapter nine or chapter 10, actually, this in your new textbook. Um, energy release when one mole of atomic compounds forms. So if I was to take sodium metal in a container, extremely reactive, we have to store it you know, under oil, and I pump in chlorine gas, they're gonna react to form sodium chloride. The energy released when that is formed, that's what you're looking at, a mole of that. There's an example I just gave, lithium chloride compared to lithium fluoride. And that's simply a size effect, right? Go, going down the periodic table. There's three of them together going down the periodic table. Questions? Yes. Didn't I just do this on the quiz? Didn't you have a? Yeah, we have a similar, but I wasn't going to say Yeah, so I would say which arrange these in order of increasing lattice energy? Sodium fluoride, sodium chloride, sodium, sodium bromide. And you'd have to say, well, okay. The one that's smaller, the sodium fluoride, has a larger lattice energy. Stronger bond it takes more energy to break it apart, or more energy is released when you form it. Does that make sense? So, so sodium fluoride would would have the largest lattice energy, followed by sodium chloride, followed by sodium bromide, because they're getting bigger as you go down the periodic table. The sodium, I keep saying, yes. Yeah, so sodium stays the same. The anion is getting bigger. So that means it's kind of like comparing this. Here's lithium fluoride, and here's lithium chloride. The chloride's bigger. So the distance of separation, if you touch these, like I drew here, the distance of separation is greater as the atom gets bigger. Does that help? Anyone else? Bush. This is all I'm going to say about metallic bonds. We don't really spend time on these. You're not going to see anything on the exam about metallic bonds. I might have asked a question on the quiz, like about the three bonding types or something. I can't remember. Atoms in metallic solids are held together by a sea of mobile electrons and flows that flow freely among the atoms. That's all I'm going to say. All right. Unequal sharing in polar bonds. Now, it's not surprising to think that you might have been thinking all along that if I form 
a molecule from two atoms. And I know those atoms have different electron affinities. We studied that in chapter three. And I know they have different ionization energies. We studied that in chapter three. It's not surprising to think about, well, if I form a compound from hydrogen and chlorine, that they're not gonna share the electrons the same. One of them likes electrons more than the other, right? We learned that in the, in the uh, chapter three. So it's not surprising to say that, well, actually, you know, maybe these electrons are not shared in this bond equally, and they're pulled towards the more, to the element that likes electrons more. Okay, so we draw a little positive charge on the one. If you look at electronegativity, which we'll do in a second here, here's hydrogen and here's chlorine. The larger the number, the more it likes electrons. So this, this trend, this is a, the Pauling electronegativity scale named after Linus Pauling, a Nobel Prize chemist, who's also a Nobel Prize, who's no, also a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, so he came up with this scale and it's actually got three significant figures. They only show two in, the, two in this figure. Uh, fluorine, I think is 3.98 on the polling scale, uh, but two significant figures is fine. And what it is, is the attraction of electrons to an atom in, in a bond, in a molecule. You know, electron affinity, remember how that was measured, isolated atoms in a, in a gaseous state, right? That's the way we measured it. Oh, ionization energy, same thing, was for an individual atom kind of floating itself out in, in a gaseous state. Here's what happens in a bond, if I put these two together, okay? It's gonna be related to and correlated to electron uh, affinity and ionization energies, things like that, but it's just a little bit different because it's within a bond. And you might have been able to guess this trend. I mean, the ones with really high electron affinity would have, right? High electron negativities. Fluorine wants to get an electron, right? It's one away from an octet. It's also the smallest one in the halogens. So its nucleus is closest to the electron shells and therefore can grab electrons easier, right? That effective nuclear charge type of thing we talked about. So it shouldn't be surprised that chlorine is the only one with a value of four. And then you have oxygen at 3.5. And then you have both chlorine and nitrogen at three. And then they go from there. The hydrogen's once again, a little schizophrenic. Kind of should be hanging out right here with its electronegativity numbers. Um, so these are computer models that show you both size and electron density. So well, there's a couple of people in our department um, that do work in this area. And you can see what it is, is the, the red is the electron rich. So you look at so, something like sodium chloride, that electron is completely transferred. And we see a very electron rich area. With HCl, it's definitely more electron rich around the chlorine because the, the hydrogen's got a more green color. And then when you see something like chlorine gas, it's pretty equally shared. So we call these polar covalent bonds. This would be a non-polar covalent bond. This is a polar and this is ionic. But you look at the numbers here to be ionic, you have to be, have an electronegativity difference of two or more, which means if I take lithium and iodine, the difference is only what? 1.4. That would not even be considered an ionic bond, yet you learned metal, non-metal, ionic bond, right? I'm here to tell you that's a terrible way to think about it. I'm here to tell you about similar in nature where you see continuums. There is no black and white in nature. That's a human construct, okay? Whether it be sexuality, whether it be electronegativity, there is nothing like that in nature. We, we construct that. It's a continuum. Everything is like that, where it's gonna go from one end to the other, okay? So there is no ionic, nice little, nice little category there, and nice little category here. It's everything in between, it's a whole continuum. So you look at the, the, the particular compound and you decide, is it 
where it falls on that spectrum. It's just like an electromagnetic spectrum. There's no clear cutoff between radio waves, uh, you know, on all the different forms, radio waves and microwaves and where they fall and where they end. It's a complete continuum. You have an infinite number of frequencies, right? There's no, it's not like you have a frequency of five and a frequency of six. No, you can have 5.1, right? You can have 5.11. You can have, it's an infinite number. Same thing here, infinite number of possibilities of this spectrum. So at one end, you have purely ionic. At the other hand, you have the purely covalent nonpolar. And then you have everything in between, all the possibilities. And it's a continuous spectrum. And that's where most things fall in that spectrum. You know, you don't have a lot of purely ionic and you don't have a lot of purely nonpolar covalent. Now we, we categorize them because that's what humans like to do. We like to categorize them and say, well, less than 0 0.4, 4.4 is, is considered nonpolar. Who decided that? It could have been 0 0.3, right? This is what I mean. It could have been 0 0.5. What's the sense of doing that? Just realize that you have two extremes, you have everything in between. You know, but we like to categorize things. And why is 0.4 not polar and 0.4 one is? <laughs> What's the difference between those two, right? So we just decide because we like to categorize things, it makes our brains a little bit happy. Um, but the example I gave you with lithium iodine, that's one that everybody would say, oh yeah, that's ionic, metal, non-metal. Well, no, actually it's not even close, right? What we say it's 1.4. <laughs> It's a polar covalent bond. So let's try something. Which of the following bonds in each pair are more polar? So which is more polar? And you can look at your electronegativity chart. Which is more polar, CS or CO? Not a trick question. It's as straightforward as it seems. You, can, you don't even have to look at the chart. Just look at the periodic table, look at the trend. Which is more electronegative, oxygen or sulfur? Heck, people, the trend increases up and over. That's it. So oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. Therefore, the CO bond is more polar than the CS bond. That's all. You don't have to, you don't have, to have the numbers in front of you. Just learn the trend. So oxygen, so electronegativity is similar to electron affinity. I mean, to ionization energy that increases up and over. So the second one, is one of those gonna be more polar? No, you're shaking your head. Now, what's your name again? What is it? Maria. And Sarah, one of you Sarah, isn't it? Isn't there a Sarah? I know you're Hersher, right? I thought there was a Sarah. Is there a Sarah here? <laughs> Show yourself. So these are not going to be <laughs> these are not going to be any different. Okay, it's kind of like a trick question, but not really. <laughs> so you have two identical atoms. There's no difference. Doesn't matter if it's a double bond. Doesn't matter that oxygen is more electronegative than than. It's kind of like a tug of war, right? You have two equal people. The, the rope doesn't go anywhere. The oxygen is more electronegative, but there's two oxygens, so it's 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 a it's um, um it cancels out basically. How about the next one? All right, the nitrogen is more electronegative than the carbon, so the NH bond will be more polar. Okay. But, I'm already starving. I didn't eat enough this morning. And I got to go teach another class. I'm not going to make it. <laughs> All right. Naming compounds of ready formers. I'm going to blow through this. Let's take a look at what this chat is. <laughs> I knew there was a Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> I just look at, you know, Zoom. I look at all the names when people are taking it. They try to place names with faces and stuff. Because uh, a class this big, it's tough to get to know students. My environmental chem class, I, by the end of the semester, I know all their names. All right. Each type of compound has a specific way to write names and formulas depending on the type of the bond present. I'm going to go through, like I said, 
pretty quickly simply because your book does an okay job. It's boring to teach. And it's also, <laughs> you're not in trouble. It's boring to teach. And it's boring to sit there and listen to me talk about it. So, all right. So with the binary molecular compounds, this means basically if you don't see a metal, this is the way you're going to name it. Okay. And that means, you know, I, had a quick, I just got to get this laid, laid out. That quick, easy periodic table at my fingertips. That one's terrible, but it's not a choice for me. Oh, there. So, oh, I don't think I can erase this. What was I talking about? I forgot. Why do I want to feel out of kid? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, if you're over here, whoops. If you're over here, with the non-metals, then you're going to be using these prefixes, okay? And that's this right here. So carbon dioxide, sulfur trioxide, right? Chlorine dioxide. I don't know why I'm using oxygen every time. It doesn't have to be oxygen, but there's so many oxygen compounds. Phosphorus trichloride, okay? Phosphorus pentachloride, sulfur hexafluoride. These are all the prefixes, okay? And you don't use the mono for the first for the first uh, element. We don't say monocarbon monoxide. We just say carbon monoxide. Okay, you drop the first mono. Um, otherwise, with the ID ending, that's what you did. Okay, just look for no metals. So let's try it. What's the name of the first one? Just blurt it out. Nitrogen dioxide, second one. Yeah, so what we do sometimes, where is it? Um, we drop the, the one vowel. You don't have to worry about this because it's multiple choice. Instead of saying dinitrogen um, tetraoxide, it's tetraoxide. The A drops. I personally think it's easier to say with the A, but tetraoxide it's not a big deal i don't know why they bothered to drop the second vowel but anyway that's a, a minor point because what like i said as long as you get the basics down you're going to be having multiple choice i'm not going to put tetraoxide and tetraoxide out there the last one what's that called dinitrogen pentoxide yes there it's a little bit better than pentaoxide maybe all right oh there they are see notice the a's drop it's not tetra Okay, questions on naming these guys. And really, I wouldn't spend much more time on this than just, because you got the prefixes in front of you, you don't have to memorize it. Past years when I didn't have open book, open note, they would have to memorize it. Okay, binary ionic compounds. Now you're looking for a metal. And these are what the, uh, Main group elements. When we say main group elements, everybody know what I'm talking about? What? The representative elements, which means these guys right here, the A group, if you will, not the transition metals and not the, the uh, inner transition metals. Okay, so that's the representative. In the old periodic system, it would have been the Roman numeral uh, one and uh, those, but basically the A group, you look up here, it's got the A's up there, rather than the one through the, uh, one through 418, this is the one on my iPad is the more common way of doing it now, just one through 18. But we used to have A's like that, and it'd be easy to say the A group elements are the representative ones. So this one you know already. Sodium chloride, you just use the name of the first one and the ID ending of the second one, all right? Um, charges must be balanced. So for instance, if I wanted to make a compound out of, gallium and sulfur, what would be, the formula.
you have to figure out the charge charges first. Yes. So for what? You agree? Very good. So basically, how did he do that? What's your first name again? What is it, Tobias? So what he basically did, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he said gallium's in group three, right under aluminum, and group three typically will be three plus, right? It's a metal loser, it's a metalloid in this case. Losing three electrons, oh, it's a metal, not a metalloid. Losing three electrons, right? And sulfur, right under oxygen, group six, wants to pick up those two electrons. So those are the charges. An easy way to make a neutral compound because they got to cancel each other out is just bring the three down over here and the two over there and you get Ga2S3. Now, of course, you always reduce those if you can. So if you had calcium oxide, you'd wind up with Ca2O2, but ion compounds, there are formula units, you reduce that to CaO. That's only for the representative elements. So if you don't know where I got those charges, you know, go back to chapter two and three and remember, look at the PR table. There's a PR table with charges. So I think about, you know, electron configurations, complete octets, the Y group six is typically minus two. Y group uh, three is typically um, three on the old PR table um, is typically um, plus three. Questions? Yes. This would just be gallium sulfide. Yes. Hang on to that. I know why you're asking that question. This question, what's your first name again? What is it? Connor? Connor asked, what, what would I call this? Or what would they call it? Not just me. <laughs> the naming people. Um, gallium sulfide. Okay. Just based on this right here. Long as it's a a group element or the representative elements not to transition. The reason he's asking this question, he's probably thinking ahead a little bit. Um, and if I, if I had something like this, based on that naming, what would you call this? Now forget the two, that's the correct way of doing it, but um, it's actually iron three oxide, but. Um, but based on this, this slide right here, we would call that iron oxide, right? But this is a transition that we can't name it like that. Why can't we name it like that? Can have more than one charge iron. That is also a compound. In fact, there's, there's even more of that. There's some weird ones too. But you can't just call this iron oxide because now you can't distinguish between these two. So when you get to the transition metals, you're gonna to have to use Roman numerals to, to tell what the charge is and someone started to do that. Let's hold on to that for a second and name, were there names and formulas of the compounds form from? Oh, okay. So what's the first one's name? Potassium bromide, that's all you have to do is put an IDE ending on it. What's the formula gonna be? KBR, very good. Someone down here said it. Second one, what's the formula going to be? CaO, and that'll just be calcium oxide. Third one? An A2S, right? You should say it, right? Because sulfur is two. Remember how we did this? This is sodium. This is sulfur, take the two, move it down there, take the one that's understood right here and put it there, Na2S. Why? Because the compound has to be neutral, there's no charge. So we have to have two of the plus ones to neutralize the negative two of the sulfur. So it'd be sodium sulfide. What about magnesium chloride? What would that look like? Very good. And BCL2, we need two of those chloride ions to neutralize that plus two magnesium. Because magnesium is in group two. 
These are all representative elements, all A group. How about the last one, aluminum oxide? Al2O3, who said that? Al2O3. Okay. Now, when we get into the transition metals, it gets a little bit trickier in the inner transition metals, too. Because of what Houston said, they can form multiple charges. So you look at copper here, we have copper one oxide. People get confused, they see a two down here and they wanna call copper two oxide. The, the, the Roman numeral refers to the charge, right? So just go backwards what we did before, the two goes with the oxygen, the one goes with the copper. So that's copper one oxide, right? This is the old naming system. I'm not gonna hold, or not a, not, not really an old naming system, an alternate kind of, well, it is, it's an old one that's stuck around. I'm not gonna hold you responsible for that. We should recognize them just so we can come across them. Cupris is gonna be a lower one. Ick is gonna be the higher charge one. Whether it's plus three and plus two, like iron, it'll be ferric oxide and ferrous oxide. The iron will be plus three instead of plus two. It's just the one that has the higher charge get the ick ending. So everybody understand with the transition metals, how we do this, just simply put the charge. Now, if you don't know the charge, that's the whole point. You're gonna work backwards from that because they can have multiple charges. I don't expect you to know if I say, I'm not gonna say iron oxide, what's the formula? I'm gonna say either iron two oxide or iron three oxide, what's the formula? There's no way of knowing if you say iron oxide, that's not a correct name. Or if you look at the formula, you should be able to tell if it's iron two or iron three. So what are the chemical formulas of iron two sulfide and iron three oxide? So what's iron two sulfide gonna be? What's your first name? Joseph? Justin. Justin Dright, FES, right? Why? Well, sulfide is minus two, right? And we're saying it's iron two. So bring the two twos down, you get iron two S2, Fe two S2, you gotta reduce those by dividing by two. So they see that one? What about, any questions on iron two sulfide? So what about iron three oxide, which one's that? Right? That's iron two oxide, three oxide. Sorry. Questions? So this is the polyatomic ion table that Connor was referring to. And I think, was it on the video where I checked off certain ones and said, focus on these? I think that I do that on the video. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about all of them. They'll come with time, but I know I think things like nitrate and nitrate are real important, hydroxide, phosphate, the sulfate, you know, you got the carbonates. These are important because they're all, they're so important in water chemistry, your carbonates. Acetates, the one kind of carbon, um, organic carbon one that you'll see, this is considered more inorganic carbon. Um, Ammonium is the one plus, the only one that's a cation. The rest are all anions. So you should know the ammonium one. And then you've got the ones that are series that you'll start to get familiar with because there's four different ones. The highest one is a per eight. The lowest one is a hypoite, and they go in series. You'll see that with the acids too. If you name it, hypochlorous acid, chlorous acid, chlor uh, chloric acid, and perchloric acid. These are all the acids if we just add a hydrogen ion to them. That's what makes an acid. I might've mentioned that on the video too. So just start getting familiar with them. Once again, you have open book, open notes. You don't have to spend time memorizing them. Just keep in mind, your final exam is not open book, open note, but they give you a lot of information and they really don't require you to regurgitate stuff. It's not gonna be that big of a deal, quite frankly you'll get a big sheet of information.
Okay, this is what I was just talking about. So you can look at this in your uh, book and, and do some examples. There's the sulfate, sulfite. For nitrate and nitrite, it will be NO3 minus and NO2 minus, but there'll be nitrate and nitrite. Saw that in the polytonic table. Okay, let's naming compounds containing oxoanions. Whoops. First one, what's it called? What is it? Calcium carbonate. That's the first one. Right? That's the, that's the polyatomic ions. So just put that together. Second one. Lithium nitrate. Right? That's a representative element you have to worry about. If someone says lithium nitrate, you know the formula because lithium is always plus one and nitrate is always minus one. So you don't need to say lithium one or anything like that, right? Second one, I mean, third one. Magnesium chlorate. Once again, magnesium is a representative element. What's well, perchlorate? ClO4 is perchlorate. You missed that right here. Maybe you said that. I thought you heard chlorate. It's perchlorate, magnesium perchlorate, because it's got the four oxygen. But you don't need any Roman numerals, anything like that. No prefixes, because these are all ionic compounds. What's the next one? Ammonium sulfate, very good. Ammonium is a plus one. So you're gonna need two of them to equal that sulfate negative two charge. So ammonium sulfate needs to be Na4, NH42. Next one, this one is a chlorate because it's ClO3 and it's potassium chlorate. Last one, sodium bicarbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate. Those are both acceptable names. You go back to the polyatomic list. Hydrogen carbonate or bicarbonate. I use carbonate, I mean bicarbonate. This will come. That's basically uh, baking soda. Sodium bicarbonate, that's basically that last one is baking soda. Questions? The acids. I'm gonna leave this mostly to you because I'm spending more time than I want to. I'm gonna hit loose structures. Uh, pretty straightforward, just the hydro and the ick. So for, for bromine, it would just be hydrobromic acid. You all know hydrochloric acid, HCl. I'm not gonna be a stickler on this, just get the basics down. There's the sequence I was telling you about, perchloric acid, chloric, chlorus, and hypochlorous. So just redo these. Let's just practice this to finish up. They're mixed together now. We've got both, both the binary and the ionic, both molecular and ionic. So what's the name of the first one? What is it? <laughs> what did you say first time? <laughs> Sulfur dioxide, right? Good. Next one. Who said that was that kind of thing? Copper sulfate, do you agree? Do we have to be more specific? Because that's a transition metal, right? The transition metal copper, it's right smack in the middle. Well, that's not really in the middle. <laughs> so the right of the transition metals. <laughs> So what do we have to do? You gotta use a Roman numeral, right? To tell it which it is. Is it copper one or copper two? Copper two, very good. Why? Because sulfate is a polytonic iron, then it's minus two. Okay, so they're equal. So the copper must be plus two. Does that make sense? See when you're using the Roman numerals. Anything, those bottom two rows and the transition metals. Whoops. Aluminum chloride, what's that gonna look like? That was pretty straightforward, ALCL3, right? A 
Alums, aluminum's a representative element. It's in group three in the old periodic table or 13 in the new periodic table. So it's, it's basically plus three. Next one, I threw this in here purposely. Okay, with silver is always plus one. So no one ever says anything but silver fluoride in this case. You do not need, even though it's a transition metal, that's one of those exceptions because the only charge it takes on is plus one. Same with zinc. Zinc is always plus two. So it always just be zinc chloride. You automatically know it's ZnCl2 because zinc is always plus two and silver is always plus one. So those you do not need Roman numerals for. There might be one or two others, but uh, no, I don't think there is. Anyway, some of the ones down at the bottom of the transition metals, I'm not as familiar with their charges, but those are the two that you need to know. What's the next one's name? Sulfur, sulfur hexafluoride. In that case, the A stays there because it's not two vowels in a row. And they drop it, we got the two vowels. Last one, what's my formula? PBO2. Very good. So since it's lead four, it's plus four. You need two minus two to equal that plus four. So it's PBO2. Questions? <laughs> Can I sit down? Do I get to sit down? <laughs> How about that? I'm going to start lecturing from here. Oh, that feels good. <laughs> All right, Lewis theory. Gilbert Lewis proposed that atoms should form chemical bonds by sharing electrons to acquire electron configurations of a noble gas, the octet. This is kind of what we talked about already. We know that fluorine wants to pick up an electron to get an octet. We know that. Potassium wants to lose an electron to get an octet, right? All of this. So he's basically going to build structures based on these rules. And so we come up with this come on electron dot symbols. And you'll notice that everything in a group should be the same because the valence electrons are the same. So the only thing you're changing is the symbol. So lithium. Lithium, sodium, hydrogen, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium all have one dot. By the way, the francium question on the example, those who forgot it, is one of the ones that tripped people up a little bit. I think it was, imagine you synthesized a new element that fell right below francium. <laughs> what would the electron configuration be? Just the previous noble gas, which is OG, and then 8S1, I think. And you can all see your... Really, have anybody looked? You can see your, I opened it up right yet. Um, so the Lewis dot symbol is the same because the valence electrons are the same. We don't care about the core electrons when it comes to bonding. When it comes to bonding, cesium's core electrons aren't doing anything. It's the valence electrons. So it's got that one there. That's all that matters. So we got two for group two and then group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And then of course the noble gases have the complete octet. He knows how we put one on each side until we fill it up. This has nothing to do with quantum theory, okay? You can don't say to yourself, hey, wait, but carbon has two in the S and then two Ps. So shouldn't you pair two up? No, that's not the way it works. He actually didn't know why it worked necessarily. He was doing an accounting scheme knowing that carbon formed four bonds. Carbon always forms four bonds. And you'll start to learn that in this class and also eventually organic chemistry. And he didn't understand that really because did I have a year here? Year was Lewis doing this. I can't remember the years here. It's before quantum theory though. So, or maybe early on, about the same time, early 1900s. Um, so he's not really thinking about electron configurations. He's thinking mainly just about total electrons and we have a feel for octets maybe or something like that. I can't remember the year. Somebody Google for me, Gilbert Lewis structures and tell me what year that was. You can find it. Um, 
But you can see now with his accounting scheme, the number of unpaired electrons is the, the bonding capacity. Okay. That's what I want to say 1906. 1916? Okay. So quantum theory is in its infancy still, really, because Planck was early 1900s and it went on through the 30s. So um so um what was I saying? <laughs> oh, the bonding capacity. So the number of uh, unpaired electrons is the bonding capacity. So carbon likes to four, four bonds because it wants to satisfy and get the octet by sharing in four places, right? And nitrogen only needs to share in three places, oxygen in two, you see, and fluorine in one. That's what that is, that single electron is unpaired, okay? Don't worry about the orbitals right now and saying that, oh yeah, there's two in the 2S of carbon and two in the 2P. Don't worry about that, just the total number of valence electrons. And now you can see why a compound like sodium chloride is so favorably formed. Because all they have to do is transfer that one there, right? This gets its octet. And this now has the octet because it's going to have the noble gas configuration of neon, right? So sodium's configuration here will be neon, electron configuration, and chlorine's will be argon, right? So we make a great pair. And hence, obviously, this is the reason Mendeleev you know, was seeing that, oh, not only the so sodium form chlorides, but potassium does too. And cesium does too. Why? Oh, because they have the same, now we know, they have the same electron configuration. And the valence electrons is all that matters. So if you want to go to, and this is where we use um, Lewis structures the most, for molecular compounds. You don't really use it that much for ionic compounds. When you do it for ionic compounds, though, you should have the brackets and the charges there as part of the Lewis structure. And um, I know that shows up somewhere, whether it be smart work or, or the quiz. Did I ask you? I didn't ask you anything like that in the quiz. Just I might have asked you the Lewis dots, maybe. Did I ask you that even? No, not even that. Uh, that's right. It's up to everything up to that. Um, so this is where it's really powerful with these molecular compounds. Okay, and this symbolizes two dots, that bond there. That, that's the same as writing two dots, okay? So here are the steps for drawing Lewis structure. And this is really important. This is one case where these steps are actually useful. You know, and I say, yeah, you wanna, wanna learn how to do this. First thing you do is turn, determine the total number of valence electrons. Then you arrange the symbols of the elements to show how the atoms are bonded together and connect them with a single bond. Well, you might say, well, that's a big jump. How do I, how do I get the structure down when you just give me a bunch of elements? Well, you're gonna use this. So for instance, if I said to you, you know, um, I know a small, a simple compound like, uh, Something like this. And you say, well, how do I know how to arrange those? Right? That's the hardest part about Lewis structure. How do I know it's it's not something like, you know, hydrogen, hydrogen, gallium, and hydrogen. How, how do I know how to come up with the skeleton? Well, what you do is you use this to say, okay, the ones with the more bonding capacity tend to be central atoms. The ones with very little bonding capacity tend to be peripheral atoms. Obviously, can, if it can only bond in one place, like hydrogen, it has to be a peripheral atom. It can't be here. That's no good. That's got two bonds, you see? So you would automatically say, well, gallium's a central atom, and I probably have hydrogens off of it, right? Okay, that's how you get an idea for the skeletons. Carbon's always a central atom. It's got bonding capacity of four, okay? The same with silicon. You won't see silicon much because it's a metalloid. 
Nitrogen's a good central atom because it has bonding capacity of three, you see? It depends what the pairs are. You could say, well, oxygen is not a good central atom, but if it's bound to fluorine, it is, <laughs> right? So it all depends on what the pairs are because fluorine only has bonding capacity of one. Oxygen has a bonding capacity of two. So oxygen would be the better central atom over fluorine. Complete the octets of those atoms except hydrogen bonded to the central atom. So the peripheral atoms, do that first. Compare the number of valence electrons in the Lewis structure with the number determined step one. Complete the octet on the central atom with whatever, whatever electrons are left over, okay? Some cases we're gonna have to use double bonds. If you run out of electrons, that means you're gonna have to start doubling up bonds, okay? If you have extra electrons, we're just gonna stick them on the central atom eventually. <laughs> All right, that's, that's exactly what we're gonna do. There's only certain ones that you don't allow to do that. I'll make that clear. So, double and triple bonds. Sometimes atoms must share more than one pair of bonding electrons. So for instance, this one right here, well, it's, it's the same one. So when you did this, you, you'd add up your total valence electrons, right? So hydrogen has one, hydrogen has one. It's the group number, remember? Valence electrons is just a group number. Carbon is four. Oxygen is six. So my total valence electrons is 12. All right, everybody with me? 12 electrons. I'm going to make carbon my central atom. Boom. Okay, I'm going to put hydrogen off it here, hydrogen off it here, and oxygen off it here. Then I'm going to complete my octet on the oxygen. We don't do hydrogen, so hydrogen doesn't get an octet because it's group one there. It only wants two electrons, it wants to be like helium, right? So there's a few small ones like lithium. Of course, that's a metal, we're not going to deal with it much. But they don't get octets, they get noble gas configurations. That's why that's a better terminology than octet, noble gas configuration. So then you complete the octet on the oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I'm done. I've used up all my electrons. But what's wrong with this structure here? Why is it not a good structure? <laughs> Carbon does not have an octet, right? So what we do is you simply take a pair. We're not adding any. We still only have 12 electrons. We're just going to move one pair to here. Now you can't, you can't give hydrogen a double bond because it only likes one bond, but oxygen likes two bonds, right? Keep in mind, there's exceptions to everything. Oxygen is not gonna always have two bonds, right? Sometimes it'll have one bond. Carbon always has four bonds except for radicals and things like that, which are just really reactive. But there's oxygen wants two bonds anyway. So not only does this help us complete the structure, something oxygen wants anyway, right? So that's where we get the double bonds. That's where the case where I say, if you run out of electrons and you haven't completed all your octets, that's when you move a pair and make a double or triple bond. Does that make sense? Question. Yes. I'm so confused why you only get the dots in the oxygen. Okay, so all right, I'm trying to erase that one. All right. So following the steps along, the idea is, okay, well, you don't do the central atom to the end for the very reason we saw here with this double bond and stuff like that. You do it on the peripheral atoms first. That's just the rule because it's gonna make it easier to do. And the, the central atom you'll see in a bit is capable of taking on more than eight electrons if it needs to. It's also capable more likely of taking on doubles and triple bonds. And you don't do hydrogen because hydrogen only gets two electrons because it's, it's only got one electron wants to be like the noble gas helium. 
So it's already got its two here. So hydrogen's happy. It's done. Hydrogen's done here. We don't do the central atom until later for, for reasons I just mentioned. So then you do the oxygen. Does that make sense? That's, that's why. Now, if, uh, if I had something like this, I'd complete the octets on all of those chlorines. Okay. Then move to the carbon and see if I need to do anything else or if it's happy, if it's eight. Um, so you just, you do the peripheral atoms before you do the central atom. And if it's a hydrogen, there's nothing to do because they've got a bond. Yeah, so, so what we're doing here, very good question. So what we have here is a single bond, oops, a single bond is two electrons. So this right here means a pair of electrons, okay? That's what a single bond is. Now I've already got a single bond right here, all right? That's already two electrons. I'm taking this other two right here and moving them to here. So now it only has four of this oxygen that are unpaired, but it has two for each of these. So it's got its octet at four. It's just satisfying it with, whoops, two in each of these bonds. So we basically moved that pair and made another bond with it. Does that help? You're welcome. Is that, is that good? Other questions? So each bond is two electrons. So the double bond, that's four. Triple bond would be six. That's what makes triple bonds really strong. You got nitrogen gas, right? In the atmosphere, the major component of the atmosphere, it's got triple bond of nitrogen. Okay, so we're going to end with doing these basically. Ah, too bad. I think it's the same one. Ah. All right, let's start with CH4. How many valence electrons for CH4? Eight, right? Four for carbon, it's in group four or 14, and one for each hydrogen. We have eight valence electrons. Car Megan says carbon will be the central, and then hydrogens will be surrounding it. That's all you got to do. You get eight valence electrons. I'm going to put my carbon in the central, I'm going to attach hydrogens. Like that. Am I done? How many electrons did I use up? Eight, and that's all I had. Hydrogen's happy because it's got its two. Carbon's got its eight, right? Carbon's got two, four, six, eight, because it shares both of those. So it gets credit for those. So hydrogen carbon has two, four, six, eight, right? And each hydrogen has two. So everybody's happy. This is methane, which is the major component of natural gas. If you heat your home with natural gas, the majority of, is th of it is this. It's the simplest of the hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons being composed of just carbon and hydrogen. So this is the natural gas you hear about. Pretty much. All right, let's do the middle one then. <laughs> it's a shame that I, I already had the same one. I thought I specifically chose ones we hadn't seen and there it is right there. Let's just do it so everybody's comfortable with it. How many valence electrons? 12, we got six for oxygen, four for carbon, and then two for each of the, the, the hydrogens. So we have 12 valence electrons. Are they good? Central atom gonna be carbon, right? Anytime you got carbon, it's gonna be your central atom. 
I'm going to put an oxygen on it. And I'm going to put a hydrogen on each one of them. Now, the next step is to complete the octet on peripheral atoms that need it. So not hydrogen, but we can do it on oxygen. So we're just going to go two. You do it in pairs. You don't do one at a time because you're not going to have that until the, oops, until you run out. Two, uh, four, six. Whoops, that was a weird one. That's an excited electron. <laughs> a little squiggly there. <laughs> All right. This is the one we said before now. We've run out of electrons, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Yet carbon does not have an octet. It's only got two, four, six, right? There's carbon six electrons. It's missing two. It's not happy. The only thing you can do now, you can't add electrons. You only got 12, is take a pair and move it over here. That's all. That's all we're done. So now we wind up with this. And we've got, now everybody's happy. Oxygen's got its octet. Carbon's got its octet. Hydrogen's got its two electrons to be like helium. Everyone's happy. Questions? All right, let's do dihydrogen monoxide. <laughs> right? Water. Yeah, there's a an old, you've probably seen it, an old like school survey or something where a student went around and wanted to get testing scientific literacy in the public. He got people to sign a position to ban dihydrogen oxygen. And he listed all the things, the problems with it. Because you can list a lot of things that's found in cancer cells, it causes asphyxiation if you bleed in too much of it, you know, just things like that. And a bunch of people signed it. <laughs> Not realizing that dihydrogen oxygen is water. All right. How many valence electrons? Eight. So let me do this one in a different color so we don't get confused. So we're going to do water. We got eight electrons. Six for oxygen, two for each of the one hydrogens. Eight electrons. Very simple. What's my central atom? Oxygen. It's a no brainer, right? Ten. Hang on. I'm going to draw two hydrogens. <laughs> <laughs> and what do I do now? Right, so the, the peripheral atoms are done. We're done with that step. Just put the, ne the next two pairs here. And we're done. Everybody's happy. Now, Megan said, isn't, so we got my eight, two, four, six, eight, right? Oxygen's happy. It's got its octet. Megan said, but isn't water bent? It is. But this is a perfectly fine Lewis structure because that was the question on the quiz, I think. Lewis structure don't tell you anything about shape. That's what the next chapter does. Did I ask that something like that on the quiz? Some of you might have. No, I didn't. Oh, maybe it's on the, that's what it is. It's on the next quiz. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> There's not enough quiz, there's not enough questions for, for chapter five quiz. So I did ask like I think two from chapter four or something like that. So now you know one of them. <laughs> Was that a question you just stretch? Stretching? <laughs> All right. So Megan's right, it is bent, but Lewis structures don't don't represent shape. So this is perfectly fine. The true structure we'll learn from chapter five is actually bent, and that's really important because. Remember how we just learned about polarity? Well, which one of these is more electronegative, oxygen or hydrogen? Oxygen. So effectively, you have electrons being pulled like this. But that would almost like cancel each other out, right? You got these two positive ends that cancel each other out. And that would almost result in a nonpolar molecule, yet we know water is polar. You know, it can move an electrical field, things like that. However, if you draw it the correct way, now, if you do anybody taking physics, you do vector analysis, 
you've got electrons being pulled like this, electrons being pulled like this, you get a summation vector by putting these head to tail in this direction that is a polar molecule with what is a measurable called dipole moment. And it moves in electrical field, it can be measured. Drawing it like this suggests that it's linear and they cancel each other out and it's not polar. But it's fine for a Lewis structure. There's nothing wrong with that Lewis structure. Questions? Good place to stop.